At this time, Reverend Ronald Hanko of the Linden Protestant Reformed Church, who has asked for no introduction, will speak to us on Bavink's doctrine of the church. Thank you, Reverend Hanko. I was going to plunge right into the subject, but Professor Engelsma's storytelling compels me to do some storytelling of my own, at least to finish the story that he told about being snowed in. He only told you part of it, and I think I have an obligation to tell what Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. My father tells that story as well. Only when my father tells the story, he always ends it by saying, and I hope that you never have to share a blanket with Professor Engelsma. <laughs> and I hope that you never have to try and get the blanket back from Professor Engelsma in a cold room in the middle of the night. I'm going to be fairly brief this afternoon. Um, Professor Engelsma redefined the word succinct for us this morning, so I'll use the word brief. It's well nigh impossible to talk about everything that's part of Bavink's ecclesiology, his doctrine of the church, and we're going to have to just simply touch on some of the high points, some of the important emphases, and a couple of points of disagreement. Bavink's doctrine of the church covers more than 300 densely written pages in his Reformed Dogmatics. And I am, in fact, not even going to talk about his doctrine of the Word and Sacraments, just simply about his doctrine of the Church. And I'm assuming, then, that you know the Reformed doctrine of the Church, that you don't need that doctrine reviewed, and that you're interested just in hearing some of Bavink's emphases and some of the things that are especially important for us as Protestant Reformed churches. And I'm going to start by talking about two areas of disagreement. By the way, there's a paper as well. I was given to understand that a uh, paper was expected and some copies of it were made. If you didn't get a copy, perhaps you can ask Reverend Kuyper after the meeting and he can see to it that some more get made. I'm not going to read the paper. Most of the pertinent quotes from Bob Inc. are in the paper and I'm not going to be doing a lot of quoting either this afternoon. Just talking from what I've read and studied about Bob Inc.'s doctrine of the church. And we're going to start with some of the disagreements. I have a reason for doing that, which I'll get to in a little bit. And there are especially two areas of serious disagreement that we come across when we study Bavink's doctrine of the church. And the first has to do with his doctrine of common grace. He connects that in his Reformed dogmatics with the doctrine of the church in some rather significant ways. First of all, seeing common grace as something that is a transforming power in society and on 
the unbelieving world in which we live, Bavink has a wrong view of the church's calling in the world. His doctrine of common grace affects his view of the church's purpose and calling here in the world. He, while certainly not denying that the church's principal calling is to preach the word of God to the nations, nevertheless suggests in one place especially in his reformed dogmatics that the church through her members as a result of common grace has the calling to, to be a good influence on society and on the unbelieving world. Now, Bavink doesn't carry that thought very far in his Reformed dogmatics, but it's especially that area of Bavink's ecclesiology that has been picked up today and has resulted in that very, very strong and prevalent in, uh, emphasis in Reformed churches on the social calling of the church. And in fact, in some cases, has led to the idea that the church is really nothing more here in the world than a kind of training ground for God's people where they receive the training that's necessary for them to go out and be a good influence in the world and change the world and even make this present society and world into the kingdom of Christ. You can see the seeds of that in the doctrine of common grace as Bavink applies it in the section on the church, the section on the church in his reformed dogmatics. He also looks at common grace as a kind of preparatory grace, even uses that language to speak of common grace. And that too has some serious consequences especially for membership in the church. I'm going to use the Netherlands Reformed Church as an example, but not by way of picking on them. There are other denominations, Presbyterian denominations as well, that see common grace as a kind of preparatory grace and who use that idea to allow different levels of membership in the church. In the Netherlands Reformed Church, for example, and again, I'm not just picking on them, but in the Netherlands Reformed Church, you can make a profession of doctrine and in that way have certain privileges of church membership, but without ever professing personal faith in Jesus Christ, without ever coming to the Lord's table, and without being a confessing member of the church. And it's the doctrine of common grace viewed as a kind of preparatory grace that sets the stage for that in the church. And I think you can see too that that has a bad effect in the church. If you've got people in the church who really consider themselves unbelievers, but who are nevertheless allowed certain privileges of membership, that's going to become inevitably a stumbling block in one way or another to the confessing members of the Church of Jesus Christ. So his doctrine of common grace does come out in various ways in his ecclesiology 
and to some extent spoils too what Bavink has to say about the church and scripture's teaching concerning the church. That's one area of disagreement. Doctrine of common grace it is, as it applies to the doctrine of the church. The other serious er area of disagreement has to do with Bavink's view of the divisions that exist, especially between the churches of the Reformation. All the different denominations, uh, all the different uh, churches. In Linden, for example, it's possible to be a member of any one of some 15 to 20 different churches, some of them reformed, some of them not. And Bavink has a view of that that is, to say the least, unsatisfactory. He admits that those divisions that exist within the Christian church are the result of sin. He's quite strong on that point, in fact, but insists nevertheless that they're part of what he calls the pluriformity or the multiformity of the church. That has to do with the fact that God is pleased to gather his church out of different nations. The Catholicity of the church is part of that. He's pleased to gather his church out of all different kinds of people. He doesn't want the members of the church to be clones of one another. But Bavink sees the divisions that exist within the Christian church as part of that, and therefore not entirely a bad thing. And it's very well possible, Huxema doesn't mention Bavink's name, but Huxema emphatically rejects that idea in his reform dogmatics, and it's my suspicion that he was thinking of Bavink when he rejected that idea. And that has serious consequences too, especially as far as our calling to be members of the visible church. And I think you can see how that works out into practice. If those divisions are a part of the pluriformity or multiformity of the church, then it's not such a bad thing to stay in a denomination that's becoming apostate. In fact, it may even be in some cases a good and necessary thing. And means too that the marks of the church are not all that significant. And my calling to join the true church isn't really all that urgent. All the different denominations and churches are simply an expression of what is, after all, the will of God for the church and something good, and therefore it is not all that urgent which church, which denomination, I join and fulfill my obligations to be a member of the church. Those are the two main areas of disagreement. Now I mentioned those first, they're serious, serious flaws in Bavink's ecclesiology, but I mentioned those first because I don't want those serious flaws to take away from the fact that Bavink's doctrine of the church, with those exceptions, is solidly and biblically 
and thoroughly reformed. In fact, when I read Bavink and read Huxima too, then it strikes me that Huxima's language, even his language echoes the language of Bavink. And that reflects the fact that they stand fundamentally and basically in the same Reformed tradition and reflects the, the fact, I believe, that Huxima owes a debt to Bavink and owes that debt in this area of theology, perhaps especially, although that may be arguable in light of what Professor Engelsmith said about Bob Inc.'s doctrine of the covenant. But in any case, I want the emphasis this afternoon to be on the fact that Bob Inc.'s doctrine of the church is soundly reformed and would even emphasize the fact that the doctrine of common grace is only mentioned rather briefly a couple of times in this part of his reform dogmatics. The rest of what he has to say is good and even necessary. And there are a few things that I picked out by way of emphasis this afternoon. The first positive, in my mind, very positive thing about Bavink's ecclesiology is that he immediately, as soon as he begins to talk about the church, brings in the doctrine of election. That shows that Bavink stands solidly in the Reformed tradition and from the viewpoint of scripture, it is of course simply a fact that you can't talk about the church without talking about election. The Heidelberg Catechism, for example, speaks of election, especially there when it talks about the church of Jesus Christ. And that is to my mind, the single most significant emphasis in Bavink's ecclesiology, that connection between God's eternal purpose and love and election and the salvation and gathering of the church here in time. But that has, and that's one of the things I want to want to emphasize too, that has important practical consequences. I think that it's not at all difficult to see that only if we understand God's love for the church and understand the eternal and unchangeable character of God's love for the church in election that our love for the church will be steadfast, will be there even when the church is going through difficult times in her history. We will never love the church as we should if we do not understand God's love for the church. And Bavink emphasizes the fact that God's eternal love for his church is foundational. So that first of all. Then the second thing that I would emphasize as far as Bavink's ecclesiology is concerned is the clear distinction that he makes between the institute of the church 
and the organism of the church. He spends a great deal of time and writes a great deal about that. And that too is an important and very much needed emphasis. You understand that when we talk about the institute of the church, we're talking about the Church of Christ as we see her and find her here in the world and as she's defined by her worship services, by the presence of office bearers, by formal membership in the church, by the administration of the sacraments. That's the church as institute. When we talk about the church's organism, then we're talking about the fact that that church of Jesus Christ not only has a certain organizational structure here in the world so that you and I can find the church, can join ourselves to the church, can take on certain obligations as members of the church, but speaking of the church as organism, we're emphasizing the fact that that church is alive in Christ, and that it's the Spirit of Christ who works in the church, and the life of Christ, which is in the members of the church, and which joins and unites them in bonds that last beyond time and beyond the history of this world. Very, very important distinction and one that Bavink has right. Now I emphasize that point because what Bavink says about institute and organism very, very much needs to be heard in the church today. It needs to be heard in our own churches but it needs to be heard wherever the Church of Jesus Christ is found because it's the answer to that very wrong idea that I can belong to Christ, that I can belong to the body of Jesus Christ without assuming any responsibilities as a member of the Institute Church. I belong to the church, and so I don't have to belong to any church. That's, as you very well know, a very popular idea today and an excuse for many to forsake their membership in the Institute Church. But Bovink insists that that's wrong. And not only insists that that's wrong, but views the institute and organism of the church as one. Now, I, I can't pin it down, but somewhere in my training in seminary, it probably came from Professor Huxema, I remember being taught that it's probably better, in instead of speaking of the institute church and the organism of the church, which leaves the impression that they're two different things, to speak of the church as institute and the church as organism, with all the emphasis on the fact that they are one and the same thing. And that you really cannot be a member of the one without being a member of the other. Normally and ordinarily to be a member of that church which is alive in Christ means that I am also a member 
of the church as institute. Bavink is right on target with that emphasis. And I say again, that's a much needed emphasis in the church world today. Along with that, Bavink also speaks at length of the fact that the church is the gathering of believers, believers and their children, and uses some very, very familiar language when he talks about that. It was at this point especially that I was struck between, struck by the similarity between Bavink and Huxima. Huxima's language even sounds like Bavink's at this point. Huxima speaks, for example, in this connection of the fact that while the church is the gathering of believers, there are those who are hypocrites in the church and unbelievers. And speaks of the fact that they have the name only, the name church, while in fact, and I think you'll recognize the language, they are the chaff among the wheat. That emphasis, too, is significant in in Bavink's ecclesiology. It puts to rest, for one thing, that pernicious idea that you can have certain privileges of church membership without being, by your own confession, a believer, one who confesses from the heart the name of Jesus Christ, a seeker an associate member of the church, or something like that. The church is defined by Bavink as the gathering of believers. And while he does not deny the presence of unbelievers and hypocrites, he insists that it still has the name church because that's the name of those who truly belong and who belong not only to the church, but to God himself. It's at that point, too, in his theology that Bavink begins to speak of the attributes of the church. One holy Catholic, and the Nicene Creed adds apostolic, church. And Bavink makes the significant, although very traditionally reformed point, that those attributes of the church are a matter of faith. Now, that's nothing new in reformed theology. That's not something that's unique to Bavink. You'll find it it in every reformed, good reformed dogmatics or theology that the attributes of the church, her holiness, her unity, are not something to be seen, but something to be believed. And, of course, that's what we, we confess ourselves every time we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe one holy Catholic Church. And make that confession sometimes when the church is being torn apart by troubles or errors. Make that that confession when we see so much sin in ourselves and in the other members of the church. 
Bob insists that those attributes are a matter of faith. And that too is a significant aspect of his ecclesiology and one that has all kinds of practical consequences. I am absolutely certain that if you and I walk in relation to the church, walk by sight and not by faith, that we will not long be members of any church at all. It is very much the case that we are members of the church by faith and that we become communicant members of the church in the way of confession of faith. And that confession of faith is really a promise that as long as we live and our members of the church here on earth, we will view her not as we see her with our, with our eyes, but we'll view her by faith. Faith in Christ as the head of the church, as the one who gathers his church and preserves her to the end of time. A significant aspect of Bavinck's ecclesiology. One more I, I could mention as, as many as, as are part of the reformed doctrine of the church, but one more thing that struck me as I was reading Bavinck's ecclesiology is his emphasis on the fact that the church has just one mark. We talk about three usually, preaching, the sacraments, and discipline. Presbyterianism, they talk about three, but usually it's the preaching, the sacraments, and worship. But Bavink is right, biblically right, when he says that there is really just one mark of the church and that's the preaching, or really, to put it in Bavink's own language, the Word of God. You'll find that same emphasis in Huxima. When he talks about the worship or the marks of the church, then he insists too that there really is just one mark. And that too is an important and necessary emphasis. It's a reminder that there is really only one thing that matters in the Church of Jesus Christ, and that's this. If there's any fault to be found with Bavink at that point, it's the fact that he speaks more of Scripture than of the preaching of the Word. And I think they, it's there that Huxima does better than Bavink when he insists that it's the Word preached that is the principal mark of the Church of Jesus Christ. Where the Word is, I'm paraphrasing Huxima now, where the Word is, there you find the Church where the preaching of the word is not heard, there the church of Jesus Christ is not to be found. And where the preaching of the word is not heard as it should be, there you have a church that is in desperate need of reformation. That's Huxima. But Huxima stands in that regard in the same line as does Bavink in his ecclesiology. And that emphasis on the primacy of the Word of God 
is perhaps the thing that the church today needs to hear more than anything else. They need to hear it from Bavink, but through Bavink from the Word of God. Without the Word, the church is nothing. And unless the church, today's church, remembers that the Word of God is her foundation, her strength, her life, her hope, her unity, her peace, she's going to perish. And much of the church world is perishing for that reason. Those, and I understand that that's very brief, those are some of the principal emphases of Bavink's ecclesiology. But what strikes me as I talk a little bit about those is this, that the most extraordinary thing about Bavink's doctrine of the church is that it's so ordinary. It's nothing more, nothing less than the Reformed doctrine of the church, which is itself nothing more and nothing less than the teaching of the Word of God concerning the church. And that's, that's what makes the republication of Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics, to my mind anyway, a rather sad thing. It seems, and they've been around now for a few years in English, it seems that the church has not picked up on any of that teaching and isn't going to. And that, strangely, the only thing that they've picked out of Bavink's ecclesiology are his errors. That emphasis on common grace as a transforming power in the world and the calling of the church to be salt and light in the world, as they say. They need to put that aside and hear what Bavink has to say in teaching the standard reformed doctrine of the church. If ever the church today is going to be anything more than she is and is not going to become just an entertainment palace a social club, whatever. The church is going to be more than that. The church needs to hear in the catechism classes and in the preaching of the word and in the seminaries what Bavink has to say about the church. It's reformed, but it's biblical. And it's the only hope of God's church. And that's one of the reasons too why, why I think it's worth reading Bavink's Ecclesiology. For us, it's a very powerful reminder of the fact that these doctrines have always been at the heart and soul of what we believe about the church, of our membership in the church, and of our hope for the church of Jesus Christ as it's represented in our own denomination and churches. We need to hear it too, need to read it, need to understand what Bavink has to say. Bavink. Vavink sees true spirituality 
as being something that is inseparably connected with the church. That probably has to do with, with his roots in the secession and the deep piety that he learned as a child of the secession. But it's very striking that for him, spirituality, piety, godliness are never ever something independent of the Church of Jesus Christ. And that too is is something that you and I see, see the see its opposite in the church world today. My own personal spiritual condition becomes the measuring stick for everything. How I feel, whether in the worship services and under the preaching of the gospel, I have some kind of warm, fuzzy feeling inside of me. That becomes the measuring stick for everything, and finally even for my membership in the church. Where I go, which church I belong to, is determined not by the word of God, not by the marks of the church, not by what the Bible teaches about the church, but by what I feel inside me. And it wasn't so for Bavik. And that more than anything else comes out in his ecclesiology. Bavink, Bavink does in his theology what we're commanded to do by the word of God in Psalm 48. Walk about Zion and go round about her. Tell the towers thereof, mark ye well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that ye may, that ye may tell it to the generation following. That's what his ecclesiology is all about. And it's a reminder to us that we must do the same. Thank you.